A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis brought to you by Shankara Ace Academy. Today we are going to cover the news articles from the Hindu edition dated 24th of February 2022. And these are the articles I have taken today for discussion. And without wasting much time, let us get to the first discussion for today. So let us begin with our first discussion for today. And this discussion is going to be based on these two important news articles. This front page article talks about a money laundering case in which a minister from Maharashtra has been placed in the custody of enforcement directorate and this second article provides certain information regarding money laundering this information was given by the central government to the supreme court so you'd have understood that the topic we are going to discuss today is money laundering so we'll understand what is money laundering its stages and important laws which is applicable here and also the agencies that deal with money laundering but why this topic today why is it important for us see money laundering is an important area from mains perspective especially under the internal security area as you can see here the topic itself exists in the syllabus also under gs paper 3 plus already we have mains questions based on this topic for example if you take this 2013 question it is a direct question on money laundering so due to this importance only we are going to discuss about money laundering today and we'll also see how it is linked to other crimes see basically if you see the term money laundering you have laundering here so what is laundering it means washing or cleaning and here the money is laundered that is the money is cleaned so that means for the money to be cleaned first it has to be dirty so what is the dirty money here it is the money that has been obtained illegitimately or through an criminal activity so this dirty money is what is cleaned or laundered in the money laundering process that is this dirty money is turned into a clean money so we can say that the illegal process of making large amounts of money that is generated by a criminal activity into a money from legitimate source is called as money laundering here the criminal activity could be drug trafficking terrorist funding etc so we are calling it the dirty money because assume that a criminal is obtaining money by selling drugs now selling drugs is a crime so whatever money that criminal is obtaining is a money which is illegitimately obtained so that money cannot be showed to the government so this becomes the illegitimate money of that criminal but that criminal wants to use that same money for his own purposes and to use that money first that criminal has to make it look like that money has been obtained from a legitimate source so this process of making it look like from a legitimate source is what is called as money laundering and this is linked to other crimes because the money obtained through various crimes can be easily changed into a money from a legitimate source through this money laundering process that is why we say that money laundering encourages illegal activities such as drug trafficking so you would have understood that this money laundering is a serious financial crime and it is employed by street level criminals as well as white collar criminals see here the term white collar criminal means the one who is engaging in the white collar crimes so what type of crimes are called as uh, white collar crimes see wide range of scams that is perpetrated by business and government officials fall under this white collar crime category because here they do not involve the use of physical force or violence but instead they carry out these crimes using fraud concealment or breach of trust for example the money obtained through corruption which we call as black money is also a illegal money and corruption is a white collar crime So this illegally obtained money can be changed into a white money or a clean money through this money laundering process and that is why most financial companies have anti money laundering policies in place to detect and prevent this activity so how this money laundering actually works we saw that the dirty money is changed into clean money and it is made to look like from a genuine source and for this three processes is involved these three processes are placement layering and integration through these three processes the dirty money is turned into a clean money by a criminal so in this the first stage or the process is placement this is the initial stage of money laundering and this is where actually the dirty money is changed into a legitimate money that is here is where the dirty money is cleaned 
Why? Because in this stage only, the launderer or the criminal introduces his or her illegal profits into the legal financial system. So how they introduce it? They use two ways. First is they break down the large amounts of cash into less conspicuous smaller amounts and then they deposit these smaller amounts directly into a bank account. So here the breaking up of large amounts of cash money into smaller amounts and placing it in the bank is called as placement. Or sometimes they also purchase a series of monetary instruments like checks, money orders etc. which they collect and deposit into different accounts at another location. So now here the funds have entered the financial system. Now comes the second stage. The second stage is the layering stage. In this phase, the launderer engages in a series of conversions or movements of the cash to separate that cash from their source. That is already it is introduced in the financial system. Now from there they will be continuously moved to other financial systems. Here the money may be channeled through the purchase and sale of investment instruments like securities or bonds or here the launderer might simply send the funds through a series of accounts at various banks across the globe. So when that money goes through a series of banks, tracing its original source is very difficult. And in this manner, they easily change the illegitimate source of money into a legitimate source. And you should note that laundering through widely dispersed accounts is especially common in nations which refuse to cooperate with anti-money laundering investigations. Because there are mechanisms in place which look into those deposits that go into many transactions. But when the nations, they do not want to cooperate with anti-money laundering investigations, we may not know whether that money has a legitimate source or not. So in these two stages, the launderer disguises the transactions as payments for goods or services and gives that money a legitimate appearance. Here, the launderer may use sequence of transactions, bookkeeping tricks to mask the source of the money. So now, the money is placed and it is layered. Now, the third stage is more important for the criminal, which is the integration stage. Why? Because this is where the illegitimate money is re-entering the legitimate economy. See, in the first two processes, the illegitimate money is turned into white money. Now, the criminal has the money which has been cleaned. Now, the criminal will not just sit with that money. He or she will invest that money and will try to multiply it. So, here the launderer might choose to invest the funds into real estate, luxury assets or even business ventures. But now the criminal will be withdrawing the money from the legitimate accounts because in the layering process, the original source of the money has been disguised. So these are the three important stages in money laundering. First is placement, second is layering and third is integration. Now the first stage is difficult for the criminal because at that stage, the criminal will be having bulk of uh, illegitimate cash. So it will be difficult for them to split it and deposit it in banks. If they can easily do that and then the other two processes will be much easier for them to do. And that is why many of the mechanisms that is put in place in the international level, they try to stop the money laundering process at the placement level itself. So this is the brief you need to know about money laundering and how it works. So now let us see how India handles or tackles money laundering. See, for this, we first needed legislation and one of the most important legislations brought by India for the prevention of money laundering is the PMLA Act, that is Prevention of Money Laundering Act of 2002. So basically, this act has three objectives. First is to prevent and control money laundering. Second is to confiscate and seize the property which is obtained from the laundered money. And third, it deals with any other issue that is connected with money laundering in India. Now, according to Section 3 of this Act, anybody who directly or indirectly attempts to engage in or knowingly assist or is a party to any process or action that involves the proceeds of crime and projects a property as untainted property is called as guilty of money laundering. Apart from this, the Act also prescribes the obligation on the banking companies, financial institutions and intermediaries for verifying and maintaining the records of identity of all its clients 
and they also need to maintain records of all the transactions and they should furnish information of such transactions in the prescribed form to the financial intelligence unit of india see here the financial intelligence unit of india was set up by the government of india in 2004 It is a central national agency which is responsible for receiving, processing, analyzing and disseminating information that is relating to suspect financial transactions. This Financial Intelligence Unit of India is also responsible for coordinating and strengthening the efforts regarding national and international intelligence investigation and enforcement agencies in pursuing the global efforts against money laundering and related crimes. and here note that this agency is an independent body reporting directly to the economic intelligence council headed by the finance minister and its administration comes under the department of revenue ministry of finance now as per the pmla act the director of this agency can impose fine on banking companies financial institutions or intermediaries if they themselves or if their officers fail to comply with the provisions of the pmla act Apart from this the PMLA act also empowers certain officers of the directorate of enforcement that is ED to carry out investigations in cases that involve the offense of money laundering and they can also attach the property which is involved in money laundering so that means the enforcement directorate can undertake survey search seizure arrest prosecution action against the offenders of any offense mentioned in the PMLA act and it can also attach or confiscate the proceeds of crime under the PMLA act so these two are the important bodies in india that directly deals with money laundering the first one is financial intelligence unit india and the second one is enforcement directorate now apart from this even in the international level we have many agencies that tackle money laundering one of the main agencies in this regard is the financial action task force See, as you know this is an intergovernmental body which sets standards and develops and promotes policies to combat money laundering and terrorist financing and india became a member of fatf in 2010 apart from this we also have the egmont group it serves as an international network that fosters improved communication and interactions among the financial intelligence units So basically the goal of Egmont group is to provide a forum for the financial intelligence units around the world so that they can improve support to their respective governments in the fight against money laundering terrorist financing etc and note that the financial intelligence unit india is also a member of this egmont group and another important international body in this regard is the asia pacific group on money laundering in short it is called as apg See this APG was officially established as an autonomous regional anti money laundering body in 1997. So remember it is a regional body and the purpose of APG is to facilitate the adoption, implementation and enforcement of the internationally accepted anti money laundering and anti terrorist financing standards. These standards are the ones which are set out in the recommendations of the Financial Action Task Force. So the recommendations of the fatf are adopted implemented and enforced by the apg i note that india became a member of apg in 1998 itself so these are the mechanisms that is put in place at the national level and also at the international level to tackle the menace of money laundering but what is the exact status of money laundering so according to the data given by indian government to the supreme court a united nations report has mentioned that the proceeds of crime that is being laundered around the world amounts to 2.1 trillion dollars and this accounts for 3.67 percentage of the global gdp and with respect to india the total proceeds of crime in the pmla cases which is pending before the court is around 67000 crore rupees and the government has also noted that the number of pmla cases investigated by the enforcement directorate has actually increased in the last 5 years that is from 2015 16 to 2020 21 and the central government has also mentioned that around 18000 crore rupees has been confiscated under the pmla act from the fugitive businessmen like vijay malliya nirav modi and mehul choksi and this money has been returned to the banks already so from this the indian government is trying to say that it is doing everything in its power to tackle money laundering and return the money to the banks so these are all some of the points that you need to note about money laundering So let us just revise what we just saw. 
we saw that money laundering is a process in which dirty money is turned into clean money or white money and this process involves three stages the first stage is placement here the money is split into small amounts and placed in the financial system and the second stage is layering here the already placed money is channeled through various banks around the globe and its original source is disguised and the third stage is integration this is where the illegitimate money reenters the legitimate economy and then we saw that india is having the prevention of money laundering act of 2002 to deal with money laundering and under this act two important bodies deal with money laundering cases one is the financial intelligence unit of india here the director of this financial intelligence unit of india can impose fine on the banking companies or financial institutions if they fail to comply with the pmla act and the second body that deals with uh, money laundering is the enforcement directorate it can search seizure arrest prosecute the offenders under pmla act it can also attach and confiscate the proceeds of crime under this act now in the international level we have uh, three main bodies first one is financial action task force india is a member of this task force then the egmont group which is an international network of the financial intelligence units around the world and the indian financial intelligence unit of fiu ind is a member of this group and the third body is the asia pacific group on money laundering in short apg this has the responsibility of adopting implementing and enforcing the standards set out in the recommendations of fatf and india is a member of this apg and finally we saw some data related to money laundering you can use that data in your mains answer writing to enrich your answer so now with this information in mind let us get to the next discussion so our second discussion is going to be based on this news article according to it union home ministry has designated the office of security printing and minting corporation of india as a prohibited area under the official secrets act So in this discussion we'll see about this corporation in brief and we'll also see about the official secrets act and under which section a place can be declared as a prohibited area we'll see that also first let us see about the corporation see the security printing and minting corporation of india limited spmcil it was formed in 2006 under the companies act of 1956 this corporation was founded as the result of corporatization of security presses and mints that were functioning under the indian ministry of finance i note that this corporation is a mini ratna category 1 cpsc and it is wholly owned schedule a company of government of india it comes under the administrative control of department of economic affairs under ministry of finance now this corporation is significant because this is the place which created the new series of 2000 and 5000 denomination notes in 2016 and now this corporation is declared as a prohibited place under the official secrets act why because they wanted to prevent the entry of unauthorized persons so in this regard he noted that the official secrets act which is in force now was enacted in 1923 so you can understand that it was enacted before independence and it has been retained after independence So this act has roots in the British colonial era. Actually the original version of this act was the Indian Official Secrets Act of 1889. See this 1889 act was enacted because at those times a vast number of newspapers had sprouted up in numerous languages and the main theme of those newspapers was to oppose the British Raj's policies and to create political awareness but at the same time risking police crackdowns and prison sentences. So to counter this situation the British Raj at that time came up with this act so it was brought in with the main goal of trying to silence the voices of newspapers now this 1889 act was amended and was made more stringent in the form of Indian Official Secrets Act of 1904 yes you are right at this time lord curzon was the viceroy of india then in 1923 a newer version was notified This version is the one which is in force now. This 1923 Indian Official Secrets Act was extended to all the matters of secrecy and confidentiality in governance in the country. I note that mainly this act broadly deals with two aspects. First is spying or espionage. This is covered under section 3 of the act. And second it deals with disclosure of other secret information of the government under section 5 of the act. 
and note that such a secret information could be any official code password sketch plan model article note document or information so as per section 5 the person who is communicating the information as well as the person receiving the information both can be punished and here should remember that for classifying a document as a secret a government ministry or department actually follows the manual of departmental security instructions of 1994 why because the official secrets act does not prescribe any procedure for classifying a document as a secret document rather the official secrets act only mentions what will be done after a document is declared as a secret for example it should not be shared if it is shared then it will be considered as uh, spying or espionage etc but just remember that it is the discretion of the government to decide what falls under the ambit of a secret document and uh, which will be charged under official secrets act so now what about a prohibited place yes the official secrets act also deals with a prohibited place it is defined under section 2 clause 8 according to it it refers to any work of defense arsenal naval military or air force establishment it also includes a place where any munitions of war or any sketches models plans or documents relating to it is made or repaired etc and note that such a place need not be a government place but even a place under contract with the government could also be a prohibited place and mainly under section 2 Subsection 8C central government can declare any place as a prohibited place and under this only now SPMCIL has been declared as a prohibited place there are many advantages to the government by declaring a place as a prohibited place see if anyone uses unauthorized uniforms or falsifies reports or uses forgery or impersonates a person or uses false documents to gain admission to a prohibited place then they will be guilty of an offense and such an offense is punishable with imprisonment of up to 1 2 3 years or with fine or even with both fine and imprisonment Apart from this according to section 7 of the act no one can interfere with the officers of the police or members of the armed force of the union in a prohibited place if someone interferes then they will be punishable with an imprisonment of up to 1 to 3 years or fine or with both and plus if anyone with the aim of being prejudicial to the safety or interest of the indian state approaches inspects or passes over or even enters a prohibited area they will be considered as spies and penalties will apply to them so to provide such kinds of protection only a place is declared as a prohibited place under the official secrets act and these were the important points that you need to know from this discussion so now let us move on to the next discussion So now our next discussion is going to be based on this text and context article. It is about a policy proposal released by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. So this policy we are talking about is the Draft India Data Accessibility and Use Policy 2022. This policy is broad since the generation of uh, citizen data is expected to increase exponentially in the next decade. So the government is now looking to license and sell the public data to the private sector through this policy. So in this regard let us see the objectives of this policy and certain important provisions of this policy and finally we'll also see the issues related to it. And before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. First let us start our discussion by seeing the underlying principles for this policy. So we all know that data is a valuable economic and social resource. it offers enormous opportunities for citizens businesses and governments and in the current technological era we have increasing digitization and engagement so the volume of data is also increasing exponentially and this has many positives particularly it provides opportunities for better governance service delivery and innovation in sectors that are critical for societal transformation and since india is aiming to become a 5 trillion dollar economy it deeply depends on its ability to harness the value of data and considering this only the india data accessibility and use policy has been framed by the government of india It aims to enhance the access, quality and use of data in line with the current and emerging technology needs of the decade. 
So based on this, there are certain listed out objectives of this policy. See, the policy aims to radically transform India's ability to harness public sector data for catalyzing large-scale societal transformation. And here you should note that any data sharing shall happen within the legal framework of India. That is, it shall happen within the national policies and legislations of India as well as under the recognized international guidelines. So, such a robust data sharing ecosystem will be unlocked by undertaking these activities for example by facilitating the creation of public digital platforms by streamlining intergovernment data sharing by promoting transparency accountability and ownership in data sharing etc so through all these actions and objectives the policy aims to create a robust data sharing ecosystem so what is the applicability of this policy see this policy will be applicable to all the data and information which is created generated collected archived by the government of india either directly or through authorized agencies of various ministries departments organizations agencies and autonomous bodies but here the policy states one particular point that is the state governments will be free to adopt the provisions of this policy and the protocols as applicable so we can say that according to the draft policy it is not necessary for the state governments to adopt the policy as it is so now let us see the key provisions of this policy the first important provision in this policy is that it aims to set up an india data office ido this will be set up by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology and the objective of this India Data Office will be to streamline and consolidate data access and sharing the public data repositories across the government and other stakeholders. Now along with setting up of an India Data Office, the policy also aims to set up India Data Council. This India Data Council will be constituted comprising of India Data Officer and Chief Data Officers. And this council will be undertaking the tasks that requires deliberations across ministries, departments and state governments for defining high value data sets and value data sets and the deliberations across these entities for finalizing the data standards and metadata standards. And they will also review the implementation of the policy through this council. So after creating these two important bodies, the policy also aims to make the data open by default. See, all data for every government, ministry, department or organization shall be open according to the policy and they shall be shareable by default. But here note that there are two exceptions, that is the data will not be open and shareable in two instances. First, when the data is categorized under the negative list of the data sets. And second, when the data is categorized under restricted access and when it is shared only with trusted users under a controlled environment. And these trusted users will be defined by the concerned ministry or department. So here remember the negative list of data sets is the list which mentions the data assets that are deemed to be non-shareable by the ministries or departments. So what kind of data sets can be under this negative list? Obviously the data sets which are considered confidential in nature and the data sets that needs to be not shared in the interest of the country's security. These will be coming under the negative list. Other than these two exceptions, all other data shall be open and shareable. So in this regard, the policy also mentions about government to government sharing. See, as per the policy, all government ministries and departments shall identify all the existing data assets and create certain detailed searchable data inventories. And these approved inventories will be federated into a government wide searchable database so that it can facilitate government to government data sharing. And one of the main purposes behind this government to government data sharing is to minimize the duplication of data processing efforts and also to enable better delivery of citizen centric services. Now to enable this government to government sharing, we need integrated data portals. And for this also, the policy has a provision According to it, all data portals or dashboards which are maintained by the ministries or departments should be integrated with the government data portal. And for this, the technical and implementation support will be provided. It will be provided by the India Data Office. In addition to all these provisions, we also need to identify the high value data sets. 
these high value data sets will be identified through an indicative framework this framework will be notified by the India Data Council and note that such high value data sets will be defined based on their degree of importance in the market their degree of socio-economic benefits, their impact on India's uh, artificial intelligence strategy and also India's performance on key global indices. And more importantly, there is also a provision for price discovery of the data. See, price discovery refers to the act of determining a common price for an asset. So here the asset is the data. So this common price will be set by the India Data Office and according to the policy the minimally processed data sets will be made available at no cost that is at zero cost this is to promote innovation and research and development but we have to remember that not all data sets will be free as per the policy for example certain detailed data sets that have undergone value addition may be valued by the departments of central and state governments and the IDO that is India data office will notify the licensing frameworks and valuation models that enable fair price discovery to be used by the ministries and the policy also notes that the pricing for restricted access data sharing will be decided by the government agency in a transparent manner now along with all these provisions the policy also talks about data anonymization and privacy preservation. See, anonymization is the process of rendering personal data anonymous. That is here, the personal direct and indirect identifiers that may lead to an individual being identified are removed in the process. So we can say that in data anonymization, the personal data is transformed or converted to a form in which the data principle cannot be identified. And according to the policy, this will be an irreversible process. Now here, the policy mentions that the reference anonymization tools and decision-making frameworks will be provided to all ministries to assist data officers in managing data sharing requests. And it will also be the responsibility of all the ministries to comply with the minimum anonymization standards which are defined by the India Data Office and by the ministry. So through this data anonymization, government aims to tackle the issue of privacy. Now the next important provision is with respect to data retention. So when you say data retention, it refers to the set of guidelines that define how long an information must be kept and how that information will be disposed when it is no longer needed. So according to the policy, every central government department will have to define its data retention period for specific data sets. And the departments should ensure compliance with such data retention period while managing storage and sharing of data sets. So in this regard, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology will develop a broad set of guidelines to help other ministries to define their data retention policy. And along with this, the policy also prescribes a data sharing toolkit. This toolkit will be provided to all ministries to help assess and optimally manage the risks which are associated with data sharing and data release. So this data sharing toolkit will help the data officers to identify whether the data set qualifies for release or not or whether it qualifies for restricted sharing or whether it needs to be on the negative list etc. It will also help the data officers to identify the appropriate release mechanism of such data and to identify the required degree of anonymization. So overall, you have to remember three points. One is that data will belong to the government. That is, the data shall remain the property of the concerned department which collected it. And second, the entities will be required to cite the original data source when they acquire the data. They should assume all responsibilities as to the use, analysis and interpretation of the data that is being provided. And finally, they should also ensure compliance. That is, the data sharing must be in compliance with the guidelines for legal, security, IPR copyrights and privacy requirements. So these are some of the key provisions in the policy. Now before concluding the discussion, we will see some of the concerns regarding the policy today. We will see these concerns briefly. See, first of all, as you know, India does not have a data protection law. So, there is no accountability and remedy for privacy violations. This means that coercive and excessive data collection or data breaches can happen and we do not have any remedy for that. So, in such a scenario, this policy will become an issue in the future. And secondly, the policy is a concern because of the interdepartmental data sharing. 
see this also poses privacy concerns because the open government data portal which contains data from all departments may result in the creation of a 360 degree profiles that is uh, what we are doing what we will be doing they can create profiles of us what we like what we don't like where our loyalties are etc so this will enable state sponsored mass surveillance but you may think that we have data anonymization also but the problem is even though the policy mentions the anonymization tools as irreversible we should also remember that there are automated tools for reidentification of anonymous data plus there is also a lack of legal accountability and the policy does not provide any independent regulatory oversight with respect to anonymization so we may not know whether anonymization is applied or not further there is no mention of how the data sharing will help ensure demands for accountability and redressal and most importantly the policy bypasses parliament so we saw that the data sharing will happen and for that entities will be created and all the activities that will be carried out under the policy will be borne from public funds but the policy does not mention about getting the approval of the parliament for using the public funds so that is a concern that the public funds may be misused if there is no proper accountability and the final concern is the issue of federalism see the policy notes that state governments will be free to adopt the portions of the policy but it does not specify how such freedom will be achieved so these are some of the concerns with the policy let us revise what we saw in this discussion we saw about the draft india data accessibility and use policy of 2022 we saw that it aims to radically transform india's ability to harness public sector data and it aims to create a robust data sharing ecosystem and for this india data office will be set up by the ministry of uh, electronics and it it will streamline and consolidate the data access and data sharing and then india data council will be set up it will comprise of india data officer and chief data officers it will undertake the tasks which requires deliberations across ministries and departments and according to the policy all the data will be open by default but there will be two exceptions first exception is the data which is mentioned in the negative list of data sets and secondly the data which is categorized under restricted access it will not be open by default and then it also enables government to government sharing and for this detailed searchable data inventories will be created and an integrated data portal will be established where the data portals maintained by the ministries and departments will be integrated with the open government data portal and then high value data sets will be identified based on their degree of importance socio economic benefits etc and then price discovery will be applicable to certain sets of datas which have undergone value addition by the departments of central and state governments and also to the data which has restricted access and the policy also talks about data anonymization and privacy preservation where the anonymization tools will be provided to the ministries and then the departments have to create data retention policies of their own then we saw that data sharing toolkit will be provided to the ministries to identify restricted sharing or proper release of data and also for uh, identifying the degree of anonymization etc and finally we saw the concerns with respect to it first we saw that india does not have a data protection law so we'll have the concerns of privacy violations and data breaches then interdepartmental sharing may lead to 360 degree profiles of individuals and then there is a lack of legal accountability and independent regulatory oversight over the anonymization process and then the policy also bypasses parliament and finally there is no mention about how the state governments will be adopting certain portions of the policy so with these points in mind let us get to the next discussion So our last discussion for the day is based on this news article. It says that the Union Home Minister has said that the government would hold peace talks with all cookie militant groups and their issue would be resolved in the next 5 years. So in this discussion let us see about the cookie tribe and the issue mentioned in the news. See cookies are known by different names to different communities. Some call them lushai, some call them cookies, darlongs. rokhoms and even among the burma border they are called as chins that is along the myanmar border and according to some sources they call themselves as hariims but however cookie has been accepted as the generic term for the community 
Now the Koki tribe is spread out in Assam, Nagaland, Mizoram, Tripura, Meghalaya and Manipur that is in the northeastern India where they have the bulk of their population. I note that in the past they lived in the hilltop and they maintained their livelihood through jhum cultivation that is through slash and burn cultivation and they also used to produce fruits. But nowadays they do plain land cultivation and they rear livestock. I note that linguistically they speak a language which is closely related to Kukichin linguistic family of Sino-Tibetan race. Now the Meitei community, Kuki community and the Naga community, all these three communities in Manipur, they lived in peaceful coexistence since India's independence. But they gradually moved apart due to separate aspirations and insecurity stemming from different perception of territorial lands and overlapping boundaries. And note that the Kukis believe that they do not have adequate representation in their legislative assembly also. They believe that the legislative assembly was dominated by Meitei's. Actually, in the 60-member house, 40 seats were allotted to the Meitei-dominated areas of Impal Valley, while only 20 seats are reserved for the hills dominated by Kukis and Nagas. So, for these 20 seats, the Kukis and Nagas fight. And it is said that because of this, the Kukis increasingly started viewing Nagas as both a competitor and a threat. Why they see them as a threat? It is because in the early 1990s, the National Socialist Council of Nagaland, NSCNIM, allegedly masterminded a series of ethnic cleansing against the Kukis. And as a counteraction only, a number of Kuki outfits were formed. These are the Kuki militant outfits of Manipur. And now these outfits have raised a demand for a Cookie Land Territorial Council which is to be carved out of their ancestral lands. This is the issue. See the Cookie outfits are engaged in tripartite talks with the central government and the Manipur government. And they want the Territorial Council that is the Cookie Land Territorial Council to be modeled after the Bodo Land Territorial Council in Assam. See, if you see about the Borderland Territorial Council, it was constituted under 6th Schedule of Indian Constitution. It was constituted in 2003 after a memorandum of settlement was signed between the Central Government, the Assam Government and the Borderland Liberation Tigers. I note that after the signing of Borderland Peace Agreement 2020 between the Central and Assam Governments on one side and the National Democratic Front of Borderland, the All Bodo Students Union and the United Bodo Peoples Organization on the other side, the BTC also derives its executive and legislative powers from this agreement. So basically, the Borderland Territorial Council or BTC was formed in recognition of the land rights, the socio-cultural and ethnic identity of the Bodos who were living within the Borderland Territorial region. So based on this only, now the Cookies also want their own Territorial Council and they want their Territorial Council to be modeled like the Borderland Territorial Council. Actually, they are asking for a territorial council comprising of the three existing autonomous district councils out of the six autonomous uh, district councils in Manipur. They want the Chura Chandrapur, Chandel and Kangpokpi to be a part of their territorial council. So this was the issue and these are the points you need to know about cookies and their demand of cookie land territorial council. So with these points in mind, now let us get to the next part of the discussion which is practice questions discussion session. Now let us take up this first question. Consider the following organizations, the Egmont Group, the Financial Action Task Force, the Asia Pacific Group on Money Laundering, the Eurasian Group on Combating Money Laundering. India is a member of which of the above organizations that deal with money laundering? Option A, 2 only, Option B, 2 and 3 only, and Option C, 1, 3 and 4 only, and Option D, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now, during discussion itself, we saw that India is a member of FATF, APG and the Egmont Group. Actually, in the Egmont Group, the Financial Intelligence Unit of India is a member. Now, with respect to the Eurasian Group on Combating Money Laundering, you should note that, in short, it is called as EAG. It is a FATF-style regional body. Its establishment was first announced by the Russian Federation in 2003 and it was finally established in 2004 by six founding countries. Its founding countries are Belarus, Kazakhstan, China, Kyrgyzstan, Russia and Tajikistan. And then now it comprises of nine member countries 
and note that among these india is also a member of this organization you should remember that india china and russia are members of both eag and fatf so the correct answer to this question is option d 1 2 3 and 4 Now let us take up this next question. Consider the following statements with reference to Cookie tribe often seen in news. First statement: They are tribes of Western Ghats. This statement is incorrect because during discussion itself we saw that the Cookie tribes are spread out in Assam, Nagaland, Mizoram, Tripura, Meghalaya, and Manipur. That is in the northeastern region of our country. Now the second statement: They are known for their unique drought-resistant buffalo and conkerage cows. Now this statement is also incorrect. Why? Because the tribe which is known to rear drought resistant varieties of buffaloes and cows called as the bunny buffalo and conkerage cows is the Maldhari tribe and not the Kuki tribe. So here this statement is also incorrect. But before marking the right answer be careful because here the question asks for the incorrect statements and both the statements are incorrect so the correct answer to this question is option C both 1 and 2 Now let us take up this next question consider the following statements with reference to security printing and minting corporation of india limited First statement it is engaged in the manufacture of security paper minting of coins printing of currency and banknotes non judicial stamp papers postage stamps and travel documents This statement is correct this is the primary function of this corporation Now second statement it is under the administrative control of Reserve Bank of India This statement is incorrect because this company is under the administrative control of Department of Economic Affairs under Ministry of Finance And here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer to this question is option A one only. So with these prelims practice questions, I have two mains practice questions also. Go through these questions and try to write answers to these questions and post them in the comment section. Whenever we get time, we'll review your answer. So with these information in mind, we have come to the end of today's Hindu news analysis session and as usual don't forget to like comment and share and also subscribe to shankara is academy youtube channel if you have not subscribed yet thank you